Uphold me that I might uplift thee, O Lord, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Like many of you surely did, I read the profiles of the victims of this week's shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School this week. It seems that I have become so desensitized to the news of another mass shooting that I usually feel numb before I manage to feel anything like sadness or anger, just numb. And there is something very disturbing to me about that numbness. I know it is a coping mechanism, but this sort of violence is not something that I want to learn to cope with or ever get accustomed to. So to combat the numbness, I make myself take some time and pray for each victim by name and for their families. I do it for them, of course, because I believe, I absolutely believe in the power of prayer to comfort and heal. But I also do it for me in hopes that this prayer process will snap me out of any emotional detachment I may be feeling. And so on Thursday, when the names of the victims were released, I made my way down the list of 17, reading about the heroic football coach and all the rest of them. I paused near the end when I got to one name, Carmen Shentrup, age 16. I suppose she stood out to me because we shared a first name. It was not until yesterday that I learned that we actually shared more than that. We shared a faith and some mutual friends. You see, Carmen was an Episcopalian. She was a leader of her youth group at her church, St. Mary Magdalene Episcopal Church in Coral Springs, Florida. And she sang in the youth choir there as well. And it is a small, small world in the Episcopal Church because it turns out that the rector of Carmen's Church in Florida happens to be married to a woman named Gail Haldeman, who was my roommate for a week at Our Little Rose's Home for Girls during the Honduras mission a few summers back. Gail lives in Florida, of course, but she has become very involved in Our Little Rose's And Gail and our own Julie Wade, a member here, met in Honduras and became good friends. And so Gail started joining the St. James's mission trips. And many of us from St. James's have gotten to know and love Gail and her family. She cares deeply for all the girls at Our Little Roses, and her ministry in Honduras has been an inspiration to me. And now she and her husband, the Reverend Canon Mark Sims, find themselves ministering to a community reeling from the carnage this past Wednesday. Seven members of their church's youth group attend Stoneman Douglas High, and one of those seven teenagers, Carmen, is gone forever. While we would certainly feel saddened and outraged by the shooting, regardless, this personal connection drives home for us the reality that this tragedy is not some distant misfortune that has nothing to do with us. Gail and Father Mark at St. Mary Magdalene have reached out to St. James's specifically to ask us for our prayers for their parish family as they grieve and process the horror of senseless violence that took Carmen's life and the lives of 16 others. And so it falls on me today to share this connection with you all and to ask for your prayers for our friends in Florida 
as they are thrust into the wilderness of grief and pain. This was not the sermon that I had planned to preach today, and it is not the sermon I want to preach today. But on Wednesday morning, the people in Parkland woke up not knowing that they were headed for the wilderness. They were headed to school, and some of them to work, and some of them were headed to church for Ash Wednesday services, but none of them had any idea that they would end up in the wilderness of grief later that afternoon. But before they knew it, the landscape around them changed, and they found themselves in unfamiliar territory of wilderness. Now, I do not believe that it is my job to tell you how to solve our nation's gun violence problem. And even if it were my job, probably wouldn't do much good because your mind is probably pretty well set on what you think the solution is. And that's good. I have my thoughts about this and you all have yours. And my guess is we're all right because this is a multifaceted issue requiring action and change on many fronts. But my job today is to proclaim the gospel. And it just so happens that today our gospel message takes us right into the wilderness. Immediately after his baptism, we are told that Jesus is driven into the wilderness for 40 days by the Holy Spirit. There we are told that he comes face to face with evil. Satan is there and tries to tempt him, tries to lure him away from his ministry. The presence of Satan in the story today makes us come to grips with the reality of evil in our world. I know you probably do not hear a whole lot of Episcopal sermons about Satan, but you're getting one today because he is real. Satan and evil showed up in Jesus' wilderness, and if this past week has taught us anything, it is that we cannot escape the truth that evil shows up in our wilderness too. Evil is real, and it is powerful. Just last week, I baptized some very darling babies in that font. And I asked their parents and their godparents to acknowledge and renounce Satan and all the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. And that was not for me a meaningless or an empty question. Jesus had to wrestle with evil in the wilderness, and so do we. So what does this mean for us? What does Jesus' confrontation with Satan in the wilderness teach us? What can we learn from him about wilderness? Because Mark's description of Jesus' time in the wilderness is so very brief, we are left to use our imaginations to envision what those 40 days were like. Physically, I can tell you that the wilderness of the Judean desert is stark, and it's dry, and it's desolate. It's a scary place to be. It is not a comfortable place to be. There is some beauty there, yes, and the potential for intimacy with God. But it is not a place that we would choose to go and spend some time. But sooner or later, I think we all do find ourselves in the wilderness, in a metaphorical sense. You all have had your own wilderness experiences, or if you have not, you will. There is no way to get from birth to death, from baptism to resurrection, from the Jordan River to Jerusalem, without going through the wilderness. It is a part of our journey. As one of your priests, I know that some of you have had intensely 
difficult wilderness experiences of your own. You didn't choose them, and you don't deserve them, but they happen to you anyway. And as you know, the only way out is through it. Jesus had the choice, like many of us do not have, to actually leave. He did not have to be there. He's Jesus. But he knows that he needs that time. In the wilderness, Jesus prepares himself for his ministry. And it is hard, and it is scary, but he knows that it is necessary. And when he does finally emerge, he's ready. And the very first message that he proclaims after leaving the wilderness is the message that we need to hear and abide by today. He says, repent. In the Greek, the word repent is metanoia, and it literally means to turn around and go the other way, to change course, to stop stumbling down a dangerous and sinful path, and to do things differently from now on. For Jesus, this message of repentance immediately follows his time in the wilderness, and for us, it is his message for us today. Because as individuals, all of us have a need to repent, and we also have this need collectively as a society. And now is the time. The 40 days of Lent began with ashes. And on Ash Wednesday, the, word of our prayer, the words of our prayer book invited us to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance. And so for the next six weeks, as we walk with Jesus, as he journeys to the cross, it is time for all of us to do some self-examination and repentance. I wish that today's gospel lesson was the only time in the scriptures when Jesus was confronted with evil, but we know that's not the case. In fact, he will meet evil just about everywhere he goes. Sometimes it is in the form of a demon or a spirit, Sometimes it is in the form of good people who make bad choices. And it's the latter category that will ultimately end up killing him. And on this first Sunday of Lent, we must resolve to try not to be the good people who make bad choices. And we are called to repent, to change course. And I am not here to tell you how to do it. But I am here to tell you that something must be done. Repentance in the truest sense of the word must be done because lives are at stake. We must course correct if we want to stop this madness. My clergy colleagues and I are not your policy makers, but we are your spiritual guides and your moral leaders. And so it falls to us to call the church to repentance. It is Lent, and it is time. It is past time. I am not telling you what to do, but I am urging you to do something proactive for the love of God. Literally, for the love of God and for the love of God's children in every school, theater, and church, and for Carmen, and her church family in Florida, and all of those who have been affected by this kind of violence. Lent is here, and evil is real, but we must not let Satan have the final word. So heed once more the words of our Lord Jesus after his time in the wilderness. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Amen. Amen.